Good morning. Welcome to Hillcrest. Good to see you, those of you who are here, and I believe that others will be joining us in the next few moments, getting out of classes. It is good to be together, whether we're here in this building or online, and we welcome you. It's going to be a good hour ahead as we worship the Lord together. He is good. And those of you who are online, if you'd let us know that you're there, that'd be great. You know, I talk to people every week that uh, they'll say, Pastor, I've, I've been with you every week. I, I, I'm watching. I'm, I'm, I'm there, even though when you don't, don't think I'm there. And I said, well, why don't you let us know that you're there, please? Just so make a comment if you're online. I'm not trying to give you a hard time, but sort of. Uh, so let us know that you're there. Greet one another if you're online. And it is good for us to be together. If you have the Church Center app, you can check in use that, using that app. You can also um, share prayer requests through that app. Uh, we love the Church Center app. You can also give offerings through that app. It's great. Hey, let me just uh, read a couple of verses of Scripture as we go to worship the Lord. Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. And Father, we say with Israel, we say with all of God's people that your goodness, your love endures forever. And we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you together today. Be exalted, O oh God, in this hour ahead, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's stand. Let's lift up our voices to the Lord and worship him today. Praises rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. the day in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away the day in your presence all our fears are washed away when we see you we find strength 
to face the day in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away Hey, Hillcrest family, it's uh, great to kind of see you today. I wish I was there. We would love to come and visit you folks, but the reality is we're not able to do that right now. And it's just so uh, tough, I think, in a, in a ministry like Awana and others where we really rely on relationships with folks like you directly. It's just difficult to, at this time and season, to get out and, and visit uh, and, and stay safe and well and healthy. And, we hear that uh, you folks are all doing pretty well there, which is encouraging. Had a great conversation a little while ago with Nikki Young regarding the Iwana ministry and how exciting to hear her and her passion for what's going there and, and seeing the kids come on a weekly basis. That's really encouraging. In the areas where we serve here in New York and out in the New England area, it's about 160 churches. Probably about half of them are not meeting in person. So to, to be able to connect with Nikki and Hillcrest there and hear what you're doing and working with the kids that are coming and focusing in on their life and their discipleship is really encouraging. So it, it's a blessing for me uh, when I can't leave my office and go travel and see churches and folks. So it's just a great blessing to hear what's going on there at Hillcrest. Uh, some of the things that are happening from an Alana perspective Obviously, uh, you know, going to a full digital model as we've had to do has been quite a challenge for an organization that has relied historically in a curriculum printed version. So we've been making lots of adjustments and we're continuing to tweak and modify that. And even now here in the winter, we're really focusing in on what summer and fall ministry will look like here in the U.S. and how we can help the churches uh, achieve the goals for good solid discipleship. Uh, some of the things we're working on now are uh, developing like a template or a model for some summer updates. Those will probably be virtual and uh, being able to come out uh, in a virtual sense and connect with your ministry leaders here in the area and in the North New England area. Uh, also fall conferences, you know, we do those every year. And, well, last fall they were all done virtually. Uh, we're hoping to get maybe one or two in in person, but we'll probably still have a virtual model need to have that depending upon how things go. So we're working on the whole fall conference look and feel and dynamics that go with that. Uh, it, I wanna, I'm also involved on a team. There's three of us that work together called the Field Innovation Team. And uh, we're working on a leadership development uh, I guess program or process. So folks like Nikki and other leaders, your directors that run your ministry, uh, a way for them to continue to get further education and knowledge and child and youth discipleship and how to run your club, your ministry well, and it be encouragement and be good solid leaders. So we're working on that endeavor as well. Uh, on a more day-to-day -day basis, I've got two primary things going on. One is uh, talking to Pastor Mark. Uh, we are homeschooling, have done that since about July. We started over the summer. So we're, we're still adjusting to the homeschooling model. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of scary. Uh, it's going pretty well. There are days, I, I'm not sure, but it seems like it's going okay. Kids are adjusting and doing well with that. 
Uh, we are kind of considering what that looks like for the fall and whether we're going to continue it or not. Uh, the other thing is just on a day-to-day -day basis is reaching out to like Pastor Mark and, and other pastors and the ministry directors uh, like Nick and others around and just what are they doing? Um, what help do they need? How can we, what tools can I provide or resources can we do? What kind of encouragement, pray alongside those things. And that's all done from my space here where I'm sitting at the moment. So that's, that's good. I've only had a couple visits and uh, to a couple churches here locally, but that's it. Uh, the other area is the New England states that I've been overseeing for a few years now, maybe three years. There is a couple moving into that region within um, two or three months, and we're hoping that they'll be able to pick up that area within the next year. And I'll, I'll be just focused on New York, which will be the first time in 12 years. I've only had one state to look at and work on. So uh, I do want to thank you though for your tremendous financial support. Uh, you guys have kind of like just pulled me out of the water with your your giving on a monthly basis. And I'm really thankful for that. Uh, you know, it's just in the season and everything to continue to see folks like yourself be faithful in giving and supporting our ministry has really been a blessing. And that's a whole area I don't have to worry about or think about. And uh, I'm just grateful for each of you and uh, for all you, you're doing there to reach your community. A couple of prayer items. Obviously, the homeschooling is important as we uh, work through the day to today, day to day now, as well as uh, for our fall thinking and what that looks like, whether back to school or not. And then um, for Awana as an organization, obviously, um, with COVID and everything, it's taken a financial hit. Uh, we're, in a, we're in a good, healthy place now. But we want that obviously to become a long-term sustainable model. So you pray for the organization, the leadership, just to continue to give wisdom in that. So uh, thanks. Love you all. Appreciate you. And uh, I look forward to the day when I can come see you in person. It's just exciting to be in this building on Wednesday night. Now, let me tell you, a lot of great things are happening. They're functioning at basically a capacity on Wednesday evenings. We had someone this last week complete their Timothy books and memory verses. So it's exciting to see what God is doing here on a Wednesday night, as well as over at the Family Center where we have our youth and outbound ministry. So keep that in mind. Hey, if you have children that uh, are thinking about summer camp, whether it's the day camp or resident camp. We're not sure how all that's going to work out in the different places, but this is the month to do camp scholarship for them. So they're due the last Sunday of this month, if you know of a youth who is interested or a child who's interested in that as well. And then we're always interested in taking you deeper into your faith and coming, starting tomorrow, Monday, Pastor Mark will start a new reading plan, and that plan is a way to encourage you. I was telling the earlier group that you know, since I discovered the Bible app, when I unload the dishwasher, which is my regular morning task, what I do is I just let it read it out loud to me and meditate it while it goes. So there's lots of exciting things you can do with that. But be sure to get connected to a reading plan. You'll be encouraged by what other people write about how God is working in their spirit. So do that real soon. Take a Bible, please, and turn with me to Matthew chapter 21. As Pastor Jeff said, I will be starting another reading plan tomorrow. And if you aren't familiar with the Bible version, you uh, version Bible, uh, Bible reading plans, I'll get it yet. Uh, tomorrow would be a great day to join me. It's a seven-day plan, and we'll read God's Word and be able to process it together. The details are in your bulletin. If you go to the Internet, just download um, the bulletin. If you're online, hillcrestjamestown.com, you'll see all the details there and how to join me uh, tomorrow. So we're in Matthew chapter 21. I'll give you just a moment to turn there. We're going to read just a few verses uh, together. Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 to 17. How long as I read? Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. 
But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying, they asked him. Yes, he replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? And he left them and he went out of the city but to Bethany where he spent the night. This is God's word to us today. Well, it's my privilege to lead us in prayer, so would you join me, please? Let's pray together today. And Lord, we join the children in recognizing the obvious, that, that you made it all, that the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, everything in all of creation, everything in the universe, it's what you made, the mountains and the hills, the rivers and the streams, the animals on the ground, the birds in the air, all are from your hand. And we say with the psalmist, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And God, you have made us, each one of us, in your image and crowned us with glory and honor just a little bit lower than the angels. Lord, you see us as we really are. You see our weaknesses. You see our faults. You see our failings. You see our doubts. You see everything about us. You see our needs. And you see us, Lord, seeking you this morning. And we thank you, Jesus, that you promise those who seek, find. And those who knock, find that the door opens. And so we come to seek and to find you today. Lord, it's good to be in your presence. It's good to sing to you. It's good to praise you. And it's good to bring our needs before you. Thank you that you're a God who leans in. Right now, you're leaning into each of us. God, we think this morning of Bart Johnson's family. Bart, who went home to be with the Lord, has been part of this family for years. And he and his wife, Phyllis, they were just such an important part of this family. In recent years, they've been in Florida, but... We think of Phyllis today, her heart obviously broken, loss of her husband, but also knowing that he's home with you is, is comfort. And we think of Sandy Walbesser today, Kevin and the Walbesser family and the loss of Sandy's brother, Bruce. God, we think of the Quattrone family. We think of Jim and Wayne and the loss of their stepmom, Flo. We think of their dad, Wayne, and know that his health is, is not great either. And so, Lord, we lift up these families to you today. We pray that you would make your grace and mercy and peace and presence known to them. May you be their comfort and strength. We think of others that have been coming to Grief Share this past week as we started and others who will be joining us this week. And we pray that Grief Share... Monday nights would be a, a source of comfort and peace and healing to broken hearts. Now, maybe you know of a family, somebody that's going through a, a really difficult time with the loss of somebody, loss of something very special perhaps in their lives. I want you, and I haven't mentioned their names, I want you to call out, out to the Lord right now. Just lift them up to the Lord and say, Lord, I pray for this one today. I'm just going to pause. You pray. Father, we think of those who are struggling physically, who have physical needs. We continue to lift up Candy Shoot to you. Candy and John, thank you for her successful surgery and that she is home now, and that they're able to join us this morning online. But we pray for Candy's continued healing. We think of, of Keith Erickson. We thank you, Lord, for the healing that you're bringing to his body. We pray for his strengthening after his surgery. We thank you, Lord, for that, that Devin Lanfear is uh, recovering, and he's been able to get back to school after this terrible uh, snowmobile accident and no surgeries. Lord, thank you for touching his eye and that, that it's, it's becoming normal again and heal. We thank you for that, Lord. But there are others, God, this morning that aren't here. We think of Wayne and Joan Eppiheimer, dear friends, part of our family. 
who are recovering from COVID, others that are not here because they also are suffering physically. So maybe you know somebody this morning that's not here, not able to be with us physically. Maybe somebody that's struggling because of COVID. I'm going to pause again and you pray for that one. Lift, lift up those people right now. Right now, pray. Well, Lord, we thank you that you hear, that you care, and that you are more than able to answer. So thank you for the privilege of bringing these things before you, these people, these situations, these problems, these opportunities for you today. And we look for you to answer. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray this morning. And we all said, amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord. Come on, let's stand.
the most repeated question by Jesus during his ministry was this, have you never read? Have you never read? Underneath that simple question is a life altering implication. You should read the word of God. That's why Jesus also says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Jesus knows that there is a spiritual hunger inside of every human heart that can only be satisfied by consuming the words of God. Christian, give yourself to the Word of God. The Word of God is a rock, strong and steady. It doesn't budge, break, or crumble under pressure. It's an anchor in the storm, keeping us calm when everything around us is chaotic. The Word of God is a mirror, showing us who we really are. You don't just read the Word of God, it reads you. It's a treasure beautiful in every dimension and worth every effort of discovery. It brings endless joy and eternal riches to all who find it. It's a fire spreading across the world to bring heat and light. It's a river bringing life and power to everything it touches. The Word of God is a seed planted deep inside of our hearts, producing the fruit of holiness and righteousness. The Word of God is a sword dividing true and false, right and wrong, good and evil. It's a hammer, crushing what needs to be crushed and breaking what needs to be broken. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to show us our path. So let the voice of God be the first, the last, and the loudest voice in your ear today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life. Give yourself to the Word of God. Did you know that your body is God's house? It is. The Bible says that God does not live in houses made with human hands. He lives in you, and he lives in me. You are God's house. But like every other house, right, uh, we need some cleaning from time to time. Now at the Hinman's, the way it works, on Saturdays are typically the, sort of the cleaning day, you know, everything from the bathroom to the laundry to picking up the yard and, and uh, washing the car, whatever the normal sort of maintenance stuff that's on the, on the agenda for the day needs to get done. But then usually uh, fall and spring, you know, we have what my mother used to affectionately call deep cleaning, all right, fall, fall and spring cleaning. And this was the time we, you, know, you get to clean all the windows in the house and my least favorite job, cleaning the eaves troughs, all right, and then my wife usually wants to haul out the basement and get some stuff out of the garage, and we make a dump run and all of the rest. It's clearing out the clutter. We do the deep clean. Well, here's, here it is. I believe the Lord wants to do some deep cleaning in us this morning. So the title of the message today is When God Cleans House. Take a Bible and let's turn to Matthew chapter 19. We're going to start there, Matthew chapter 19. This is our 15th week in the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be here for another month or so. And the series is Kingdom Living Here and Now. And we're going to get some quick background from chapters 19 and 20. And then we're going to move on to our key text, which is in chapter 21. So here's the big picture. Jesus has completed his ministry in the Galilee region for the last Three years, he's been largely focused on the people in the towns and villages around the Sea of Galilee. He's been preaching and teaching in the synagogues. He's, he's been healing the sick, the blind, the deaf, the mute, the, the diseased of all kinds. He's, he's calmed the storms. He's multiplied loaves and fishes. He's transformed water into wine. He's even raised the dead. And the light is beginning, finally, to dawn on his followers that he is the long-awaited promised king. He's the Messiah. So chapter 19, verse 1 tells us then that Jesus left Galilee and went into the, reg the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. All right, we're going to show you a map. 
Jesus has been based up in the northern part of Israel in a town we know as Capernaum, right? We've talked about this recent weeks. He leaves the Galilee region now, northern Israel, crosses the Jordan, and then heads south to the area of Judea, which is largely around the area around the city of Jerusalem. He's going to make a stop in the city of Jericho, which is at the northern end of the sea of, uh, or excuse me, the Dead Sea. Now, the Dead Sea is the lowest place on the planet, uh, 900 feet below sea level. And from here, Jesus is going to climb 3,400 feet going up to Jerusalem. So that's where we're headed, and we'll get to that in just a minute. So again, Matthew chapter 19, verse 2 tells us, that large crowds followed him. So he continues to preach. He continues to teach and heal people along the way. We'll show you a picture of a Roman road. This is the Roman road that Jesus would have walked on 2,000 years ago to get from Jericho to, to Jerusalem. It's still there today. It's about a 15-mile walk, you know, good, good day's journey on foot. Now, let's turn over to chapter 20. I told you we are going to go fast. Here we go. Jump down to verse 17. Chapter 20, verse 17. Now, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside, and he said to them, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. So Jesus has been predicting now for some time his death and his resurrection. But Matthew is now in the coming uh, eight chapters. He is going to slow everything down. He's going to bring us up close and personal to that last week of Jesus' earthly life. And it all begins with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. This is the, an event that all four of the gospel writers record for us. And you know what that tells me? That tells me that God wants us to get it. He wants us to understand what is going on here. Now, sometimes, you know, the Lord will say, hey, 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 listen up, listen up, right? Surely, surely, barely, barely, amen and amen. But the fact that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem tells me that God wants us to understand how significant an event this was when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem. Crowds of people lined the street, have been to those streets. Now, probably they look differently than they do today, but I'll tell you what, it is a thrilling thing to be able to stand there in your mind's eye, imagine what it would have been like to have crowds of people lined the, the path as Jesus came over the Mount of Olives and went into the, the holy city. To, and, the, and the people celebrated it, right? They were there to celebrate his entrance into Jerusalem. Now, this is happening during the Feast of Passover. There are three major Jewish feasts that every Jew celebrated. There's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or Passover, the Feast of Weeks, known as Pentecost, and then the Feast of Ingathering, or a Feast of Booths. So we're talking about the Feast of Passover at this time, when the Jews celebrate their miraculous deliverance out of centuries of slavery in Egypt. You know, the, the angel of the Lord right, had come and, and had passed over the houses of the Israelites, but every firstborn in Egypt died on that night. And that was the miracle that finally that convinced Pharaoh to let Moses and the people go. So Passover was commanded by God to be celebrated each year, and it was the dream of every Jew to be able to celebrate Passover one day, at least one time in their lifetime in Jerusalem. So many people st streamed to Jerusalem when it came time for Passover. In fact, um, the historians tell us that Josephus, uh, a Jewish historian, tells us that the, the population in Jerusalem would swell up to five times its normal uh, capacity, right? So the estimates are maybe upwards of 2.5 million people are sardined into Jerusalem for Passover. All right, let's look at chapter 21. Now, here, did I, say, did I tell you we're going to go fast? Here we go, chapter 21. <clears throat> Excuse me. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her cold buyer, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Now, to make sure that we don't miss the, the historic and the prophetic significance of what is going on here, Matthew is going to connect the dots for us in verse 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
And again, again, we've seen this, right? In Matthew's gospel, he's, he's writing to Jews to help them understand, to help them embrace Jesus as their Messiah. And, and he's, he's showing them again and again and again that Jesus is the fulfillment of hundreds of years of Old Testament prophecy. Now, your Bible should have a couple of footnotes on verse 5. It should, should reference Isaiah 62, 11 and Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. This is a direct quote, in other words, from Zechariah, prophecy, prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. So what's going on here? Let me tell you. Now, we aren't going to turn, turn there, but if, you, if we were to fast forward to the end of the book, to the book of the Revelation, okay, chapter 19, we would see Jesus in that chapter arriving a second time on a great white horse to make war and to finally stop the rebellion um, against, against God that has been taking place and was building, it, it will build it to th that point, to that point in time. Jesus will be riding on a great white horse when he returns, and that's a picture of power and authority. Is he riding on a great white horse here? Not even close. He's riding on a donkey. So this isn't a picture of power and authority, it's a picture of humility. And again, the Jews, right, we've talked about this in weeks past, they're expecting their Messiah to come and take control, to, to lead the people to overthrow the Romans and establish his kingly rule on earth. And Jesus will do that one day. He will one day come, and, and he will come again on a great white horse, and he, he will rule and reign on the earth. But here, he's riding on a donkey in humility. Again, though, fulfilling prophecy. So verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, the colt placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him, those that followed, shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! Now, the term Hosanna that we sang earlier is from Psalm 118. I read a couple of verses from that at the start of the service. It's our call to worship. It's a messianic psalm. It, 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 it celebrates the, the, the deliverance the Lord is bringing. And Hosanna means, save us now, Lord. And this was the cry of the people. Right? Save us all. Oh, Hosanna, he's here. He's here. And how many have we seen, times have we seen, I've pointed it out to you many times throughout uh, Matthew's gospel, again, that he, he references, Matthew's careful to record the title, right? Son of David. This is a messianic title, but because for centuries, prophets had said that the Messiah would come through the line of King David. So Hosanna to the son of David. Now, I'll tell you what's really interesting, and I told, I told the other service uh, I got off on a, a really long rabbit trail uh, this week on this, and I, I can't take you down the whole path, all right? I just can't do it. So I've tried as best I can to summarize here, so I'm going I'm to do the best I can. But I'll tell you what's really fascinating is the timing of Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem. This, this is nothing short of miraculous in itself. We call the day that Jesus entered uh, his triumphal entry what? Palm Sunday, right? Because of the palm branches they put on the road and so on. We just read about it. The Jews would have known it as the 10th day in the month of Nisan. And you're saying, it's the 10th, month, uh, 10th day of the month of Nisan. I'll tell you what it is. That would be the day that Jewish people selected the lamb that they were going to offer, okay, that would be part of their Passover sacrifice to be prepared for Passover. Now, what is another name for Jesus? We know lamb of what? Lamb of God. Remember what we looked at weeks ago when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming? He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is, that's the testimony of Scripture, right? That Jesus is our once and for all sacrifice for our sin. Now, we're not going to get too far in the weeds here, but there is a fascinating prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. We won't turn there, but Daniel predicts the actual date that Jesus arrived in Jerusalem. And he predicts it, get this, nearly five centuries before Jesus arrived. So Daniel's back, you know, uh, during the Babylonian captivity, all of that, almost twice as long as our nation has been a nation. Daniel prophesied, the Lord prophesied through Daniel the date, the exact date Jesus would arrive 
in Jerusalem. It's no joke. Uh, there's, there was a, uh, an officer of Scotland Yard about 100 years ago, Sir Robert Anderson, who traced this out, wrote a book called The Coming Prince. And Daniel's prophecy, so it begins in 445 B.C. B.C. 445 B.C., okay? There's a decree issued uh, that the temple in Jerusalem, which has been destroyed, can be rebuilt. And, and Daniel, Daniel says, he references seven sevens and 62 sevens. That's a reference to years, okay? Seven years and 62 uh, uh, reference. It's, it's a collection of years, all right? And, and Sir Robert Anderson, using Babylonian uh, calendars and so on that they would have used at that time, comes up with a number of 173,880 days, okay? That's the, from the time the decree was issued to rebuild the temple to the day the Messiah would appear in Jerusalem. You do the math, you trace out the calendar, guess where you land? On 10th day in the month of Nisan, or April 6th, 32 AD. It's right here. I say the Lord is seldom early, but he's never late. And we get it right here again. So I commend that to you. You do a little Googling. You can read all up on it all you want. All right, let's keep going. Verse 10 now. Just had to share that because that blew me away. Again. Again. Verse 10. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now notice that. While many of Jesus' closest followers, disciples, right, are, are are believing that he's the Messiah, there's still others who remain skeptical. Obvious here, right? They, some of them are still thinking of him as a, a rabbi, a really good rabbi. Maybe, maybe a prophet, and he's from, you know, he's from Nazareth up in Galilee. So despite the years now of teaching and preaching, despite the countless miracles that have, that have, that have been done, many still did not believe. And you know what? That isn't all that different than people today. Am I right? How many people don't believe today, despite all that God has done over the past 2,000 years and continues to do? You know, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, that the devil, the God, he says, the God of this age has blinded the eyes of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. can't see it. And some of us understand that full well, right? Because it wasn't too long ago that we couldn't see it. We couldn't see Jesus either, right? Until the Lord took off the blinders and un uh, unplugged our ears so and our hearts so we could see and understand and realize just exactly who Jesus is. And you know what? My prayer today is if you've never come to a saving faith in Jesus as your Messiah, as your Savior, as Lord, today would be the day when you cross the threshold from unbelief to belief to full-fledged embracing Jesus as Lord of your life. Now, we come to verse 12. And this section from 12 to 17 is going to be our focus for the rest of our time together. So let's look at it, verse 12. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer. But you are making a, a den of robbers. Jesus enters Jerusalem, and the first place he goes to is the temple. And he begins to clean it out, to clear it out. Now, according to the uh, Apostle John, this wasn't the first time this had been done, that Jesus had done this. In John chapter 2, John says Jesus had done this before. Earlier in his ministry, three years, I'm guessing, earlier, in the beginning of his ministry. And at that time, he took a whip. He made a whip, and he chased the money changers and the, those selling doves and so on out of the temple area. He, he, he was yelling at them, get out of, how dare you turn my father's house into a market? Apparently, they didn't learn their lesson, because he's back doing it again. Now, some of you may be reading this and thinking, wow, I mean, Jesus, I mean, obviously had some real anger issues. You know. But here's the thing. We need to understand that not all anger is sin. There's such, thing, there's such a thing as righteous anger. And that's what Jesus is demonstrating here. Righteous anger is being angered, angry about the things that anger God. I'm talking about racism. 
I'm talking about injustice. I'm talking about child abuse. I'm talking about exploiting the poor. I'm talking about neglecting widows. That really gets God amped up, and it would get Jesus amped up. You know, but, but, G, but Ephesians chapter 4 reminds us that we're to be angry and yet not sin. Right? We're not to let the sun go down on our anger. We're not to hold on to it. It's, Paul Paul says, don't give the devil any um, a foothold right, in your life. No, Jesus was angry, but his anger was directed toward those who were abusing the temple. That's why he was angry. You see, the temple was a place the Jews offered their, their sacrifices. But often, the way it worked, I mean, in Jesus' day, people would show up with their lamb to be sacrificed, and the priests wouldn't allow it. And historians, it's interesting, historians record that there was actually rabbinical schools that provided a full 18 months of training to teach, to teach rabbis how to pick out the defects in lambs. So you don't see it, you don't see, they don't see it, but I see it, and that lamb is not going to be sacrificed. No way, no way. So most people, here's the reality, most people ended up buying their lambs or their doves from the temple priests to make sure they were qualified to be an acceptable sacrifice. And on top of that, if you wanted to buy an animal to be sacrificed in the temple, you had to buy it with temple money. You couldn't use your Roman money. You had to exchange your, your Roman money for temple money. And guess what? It wasn't a dollar-to-dollar -dollar exchange. In fact, it was an exorbitant uh, exchange rate. And guess who's getting rich all the while off this racket? The priests, the religious leaders, the big shots. See, that's the problem. The temple was controlled by corrupt religious leaders. They were extorting. They were stealing from the people that they were supposed to be serving. And so for three years, and we've pointed out several times, right, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus has been exposing these leaders for the frauds that they really were. He called them brood of vipers. He called them whitewashed tombs of, of dead man's stinking bones. You know, that, that's the kind of language he used for these people. And he said their worship had, in the temple had become all about externals. It was all about just what people see. Going through the motions, but it was empty, dead religion. Going through the motions of worshiping God, but he said their hearts are far from him. Jesus cleans house, and he chases them out. That's not all he did. Look at verse 14. The blind, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw these wonderful things he did, and the, and the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They said to him. Yes, he replied. Have you not read? From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. In other words, you aren't going to praise the Lord, right? So we'll get some kids to do the heavy lifting. So as Jesus arrives in the temple, his presence begins to refocus and shine the light on the purpose for the temple. The money changers, the merchants, the corrupt priests had polluted, had, had perverted the purpose of the temple, but Jesus reminds everyone that the temple was to be a place of prayer, a house of prayer. That's what the Lord had said through the prophet Jeremiah centuries before. Jeremiah chapter 7, very famous passage, declares that the Father's house is to be a house of prayer. In the temple, there was a, an altar, an altar of incense, and as the smoke rose, to, rose up, that was a picture of the prayers that were continually to ascend to the Lord, continually offering worship to the Lord in prayer. Now, what is prayer? Prayer at its very core is communion with God. It's, it's entering God's prayer. It's connection with God. It's talking to him, yes. Yes, but it's also listening to him. It's, it's, it's uh, meditating on his word. It's receiving the, the download from the Holy Spirit into our spirit because why? Because we are spirit, right? And we can connect with the Lord. It's a spiritual dimension, and so we sense his presence with us. We sense him speaking to us through his word, through his spirit. He speaks to our hearts. Notice that Matthew also says in verse 14, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he what? He healed them. You see, the temple was also to be a place of healing. 
This is what Jesus did wherever he went. He didn't wait to get to the temple to do the healing. He healed men and women, boys and girls, wherever he went. Physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, all kinds of healing. And you know what? When you get to know Jesus and, and understand what it is to be in his presence, you begin to experience the supernatural power of God to heal in every area of your life. Just a word of personal testimony. This week's Jumpstart podcast, I'm going to share, share a bit about my own testimony of healing of late I've been experiencing with the Lord. Praise, praise Him. Um, you know, the COVID vaccines are wonderful, amazing technological, scientific breakthroughs, and so many people have been experiencing, you know, some really good things from the COVID vaccines. But I'll tell you what, it sent my, my, my immune system into a tailspin about seven weeks ago now, and uh, uh, it's been hard, to be honest. Uh, up and down, um, difficult. But here's something I realized along this journey. I be have become so fixated at times on the physical and on remedies of doctors and medicine that I almost lost sight of the fact that the Lord is Jehovah Rapha. The Lord is Jehovah Rapha. The Lord is the healer, right? And so what three trips to the ER and lots of tests and medicines haven't been able to do, the Lord is doing. He's doing in me, and and I'll share more about that um, if you want to check out the podcast tomorrow. But not only a place of prayer, not only a place of healing, but the temple was also to be a place of praise. Matthew records uh, in verse 15 and 16 that the children, the children were shouting in the, in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David. Now the religious leaders, they're like, you know, will you shut those stupid kids up? Right? Well, it's Jesus' response again. Have you never read? Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, I've ordained praise. It's a quote in Psalm 8. <laughs> that is a majestic psalm that every Jew would have known. Have you never read? You guys are so clueless. Verse 17. Jesus left them and went out of the city to Bethany. That's just a couple miles away from Jerusalem where he spent the night. All right, well, that's as far as we're going to go in Matthew's Gospel today because now it's time to ask our most important question. And I've got to tell you, we've gone really easy on you the last few weeks. Right? I've not asked you to do this, um, done it for you, but I want to hear it on three today. And I know as corny as you think this is, I still want to hear it. <laughs> I'm going to say, you are so weird. I, do, I, I embrace my weirdness, all right? So embrace it with me on three. One, two, three. So what? All right. Some of you may be thinking, you know, uh, entrance into Jerusalem. Kind of cool, historically uh, interesting. A little shocked by Jesus' uh, boldness, his anger in the temple area. That would have been interesting. But seriously, what so what? I mean, what, what application? What difference does this make to our lives today, 2,000 years later? Well, here's the takeaway for you and me. We... You and me, we are the Lord's temple. As the book of Acts declares, right? God no longer lives in houses built with human hands. No, he lives inside you, and he lives inside of me. So say this with me. I am the Lord's temple. Say that. I am the Lord's temple. I don't believe you. I am the Lord's temple. And I often remind us, as I remind myself, right, that this building is not the temple, right? We say we're going to church, we can't go to ourselves, right? This is not, the building is not the church. We are the church, right? It's people gathering, God's people. This is not God's temple. As wonderful as the improvements and the renovations are, this is not God's temple. We are God's temple. But just as any building, your house and this building gets dirty from time to time and needs some deep cleaning, your life may need some deep cleaning today. So just ask yourself, does my temple need some cleaning today? Perhaps, for instance, like, uh, like the temple in Jerusalem in Jesus' day, your temple, truth is, it's become corrupted with stuff that doesn't belong there. It could be like the money changers that you are taking advantage of people on a regular basis. You're cheating people out of money, out of resources, you're stealing from your place you work at. You're fudging the numbers pretty regularly. And you somehow rationalize that. 
convince yourself that's okay. It's not okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's a situation where you are just really wrapped up with money, making money, accumulating money, having more and more and more possessions. And so maybe today, in your heart, as you're sitting here, as you're sitting at home, wherever you are, the Lord has begun tipping over some tables in your heart today, and you're thinking, exposing some of the stuff that frankly need to go, it needs to get cleaned out. Or ask yourself, am I like the religious leaders and primarily focused on externals? It's all about what other people see, what they think about me. Are you one person on the outside and somebody, I mean, totally different on the inside? Full of ugliness. You put up a good show, you put on a great act, but today you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and, and Jesus sees, he is bringing, he is exposing what's on the inside, your hidden habits, your secret desires, right? Perhaps a, an addiction that you think nobody knows about. Well, I tell you what, the Lord knows. He sees. And he's ready to clean house today. It's time for it to go. Third, ask yourself, is my temple a place of prayer? How, how important is prayer to you? When we come to prayer during the Sunday morning service, are you one like, oh, you know, here we go again. Oh, this is the most boring part of the service. Can we get on with something else? Or is fresh prayer on Thursday nights ever a priority for you? You know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 17 says that, the Apostle Paul says that we are to pray without ceasing. And I'm pretty sure he's not meaning that we should be on our knees, you know, um, uh, 24-7. I think he, it means that we are to maintain a connection hour by hour throughout the day with the Lord. So as the Holy Spirit nudges us, as he reminds us of things, as we see people, as we encounter situations at any moment, we can pray audibly or inwardly because we have connection with the Lord to pray without ceasing. Is your temple a place of prayer or is prayer just an occasional thing? When it happens to fit in, when it seems convenient at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, maybe every seven days. Today, maybe the Lord would clean out some things in your schedule, and he's bringing conviction to you that, you know what, something needs to be reordered here. Some priorities need to happen here that, so that prayer can become a priority in this temple, your temple. How about healing? Ask yourself, is my temple a place of healing? Are you experiencing the Lord as your healer physically, emotionally? Mentally, physically, spiritually. I'll tell you what, the Lord would do that. He would be that and more. And he would make your temple a place of life and healing for others. So are you someone who sees and cares and prays for and loves on those who are sick and lonely and sad and broken? Today, the Lord would make your temple a place of healing for others. Last question. Ask yourself, is my temple a place of praise? You know, um, I'll speak for myself. Whining and negativity uh, come as naturally as anything. Right? I, it, to me, it's, it's my default setting to be a whiner, and it could be a complainer. The easiest thing on the planet to be for any of us is to be a whiner to point out the faults. Oh, they didn't do that. Oh, I don't like that. I got a problem with this, you know. I get it. I do the same thing. It's the easiest thing to be. But our temple should be a place of praise. Our, our life should be a place of praise. Do you find it easy to praise the Lord and give him thanks and to recognize and to celebrate his abundant goodness to you today? Right now. The blessings in your life. You and I are the Lord's temple. What needs to be cleaned out of your life today? I want us to bow before the Lord. Let's put our Bibles and notes aside. And I want us to take just a few moments, and I'm going to give you some time of quiet to search your heart and to come clean with the Lord and allow him to do the cleansing and the cleaning, the clearing out that needs to happen today. And then... I'm, I'm, I'm just continuing prayer, but Pastor Jeff is going to come then. Close that time and then lead us into a time of remembrance at the Lord's table.
So take this time right now. You talk to the Lord. You ask the Holy Spirit to search you. You know, that's a prayer that the Holy Spirit's more than capable of doing right now. What needs to be cleaned out? What needs to go? Corinthians 11, 28 says this, each one must examine themselves. And I hope this has been a time, as Pastor Mark has shared with us this morning, of examining your own life, discovering where God is speaking to you. I love this verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. It says, Godly sorrow brings repentance, that's change, that leads to salvation, and it leaves no regret. And if God is speaking to your heart today, about some change that you need to make, then it, there won't be that regret. And then it says, but, but worldly sorrow brings death. So I want to encourage you just to accept and embrace what God has spoken to you today in this passage. For those of you at home, if you would get ready for communion, those of you here, if you would just peel back that first layer on your communion cup today and grab that piece of bread while I read. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take a moment to pray before we celebrate the bread. Father, thank you for all the good things that we receive from you. Thank you for that celebration that night with the disciples where you took the bread, gave thanks, and started this tradition of remembering, remembering how your body was broken for us to be that ultimate sacrifice. We praise you for that and thank you in prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake of the bread. Corinthians. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take a moment to pray. Jesus, thank you for your covenants throughout all of Scripture, your promises to us. We are praising you today <clears throat> for that new covenant, the new covenant in your blood that grants us forgiveness of sin, abundant life, eternal life. So as we drink this cup today, we proclaim that in your death we can celebrate eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's take a moment to pray as we close and as the music team comes forward. Father, we thank you that you are a good God. We thank you that you teach us how to live through the words that are recorded in Scripture. We thank you for Matthew. Matthew and what he wrote and how it helps us today to live that fullness of life for those who have your spirit. So now as we continue in worship this morning, in prayer we praise you for your goodness to us and the love that you show to us. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our death, he died. Yes, yes. Go ahead and be seated if you're here, please, just for a few moments. And one of the ushers will dismiss you in just, just a moment. Hey, just a couple of reminders. Those of you who are here uh, and those of you who are online, uh, today, first Sunday of the month, we have uh, a plate in the lobby for Deacon Benevolent Fund. That fund uh, goes to help those who are going through times of financial need. You can also give to the Deacon Benevolent Fund through the Church Center app, so I encourage you to be uh, faithful in that way. Also, I mentioned earlier the Jumpstart podcast, new episode uh, tomorrow, and I'll be sharing some more of my personal uh, journey over the last few weeks. I appreciate your prayers and concern over the last few weeks. Thank you. And then Thursday night uh, is Fresh Prayer again, Thursday at 7 on Facebook Live, YouTube, and just encourage you to be involved in that way or through the Fresh Prayer podcast. You can take it with you on the go. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the time that we've had in your presence today. We sense your presence with us. 
We pray that we be mindful of you throughout this coming week, God, that we would live a life that glorifies you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. Have a great day.